Because of a, because of a speech uh, delivered by <coughs> President Pakene in Dresden, Germany, the topic of unification uh, has been on the minds of many. This is, of course, not the first time uh, unification has been in the news during the Cold War. Can you hear me now? Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, at other times, it was defined as the perfect integration of the two countries. At other times, still, it was defined as the imperfect operation of a one country, two systems formula. And still, at other times, it was defined as something that was to be avoided, something that was too difficult to imagine, too dangerous to contemplate, and too expensive to afford. What is different about the current iteration of the discussion of unification is President Park's view of it as a opportunity or jackpot. So what exactly does this mean? How is this concept different from previous concepts? And what are the opportunities as well as the dangers inherent in unification for Korea, the United States, and the world? These are the questions we will try to address today here at CSIS. My name is Victor Cha. I'm your moderator today, as well as senior advisor and Korea chair here at CSIS and professor of government at Georgetown. I want to welcome you this morning to the conference, Korean Unification in a New Era. This conference is co-hosted with our Korean friends at the National Research Council for Economics, Humanities, and Social Sciences as well as with support from the Korea Institute for National Unification, the Korea Institute for Economic Policy, and the Korea Institute for Industrial Economics and Trade. In addition to welcoming our audience in the conference hall this morning, I would like to welcome our online audience uh, who are watching the live stream at CSIS.org. Uh, and throughout the day, you will be able to follow this conference on Twitter and tweet questions to us at CSIS Korea Chair, hashtag CSIS Live. Let me now take the opportunity to introduce my partner at N NRCS for some opening remarks. Uh, Dr. Kong is the Secretary General of NRCS, the governing institution of 23 national think tanks in Korea. Prior to joining NRCS, he worked in the Korean government for 31 years, serving as Deputy Minister for Regulatory Reform, Deputy Minister for Government Policy Analysis and Evaluation, Deputy Minister for the Jeju Province Policy of the Prime Minister's Office. He also served as Deputy Secretary for Public Relations of the Office of the President. He graduated from Seoul National University uh, with a BA and a Master's as well as from University of California at Berkeley and a doctorate from Tonga University in, in, in Korea. Um, so at this moment, I'd like to welcome Dr. Kong for some opening remarks from NRCS. His Excellency, Ambassador An Ho Young, Dr. Victor Char and distinguished guests. First of all, I'd like to express my deepest appreciation to prominent policymakers and experts from Korea and the United States for attending this conference despite your busy schedule. On behalf of the NRCS of Korea, my special thanks go to Dr. Char, who has made great efforts to host this meaningful event. Ladies and gentlemen, Northeast Asia is one of the most dynamic regions in the world. The region has been increasingly con contributing to the global economy. However, the most concerning factor on the security as well as economic fronts is North Korea. North Korea should make the right choice to, to the responsible member in the international community in order to induce North Korea to this 
to make the choice. It is important to us, for us to speak with one voice, and the message must be clear and consistent. Under this recognition, Pre President Park Geun-hye suggests the vision for the Korea-U.S. alliance in an address to the joint session of the United States Congress last year. President Park emphasized that we should lay the groundwork for enduring peace and reunification on the Korean Peninsula, and we need to build a mechanism of peace and cooperation in Northeast Asia. The trust building process on the Korean Peninsula, as we all know, includes developing inter-Korean relations, establish peace on the Korean Peninsula, and laying the groundwork for unification. President Park also proposed the Northeast Asia Peace and Cooperation Initiative. We witnessed the nations of Northeast Asian region fail to fulfill uh, collectively. The region suffers from Asia's paradox, the disconnection between growing economic interdependence and backward political and security cooperation. The way we manage this paradox will determine the shape of a new order in the region. We cannot afford to put off a multilateral dialogue process in Northeast Asia. It could also reinforce President Obama's strategy of rebalancing towards the Asia Pacific. I believe that especially the United States together with Korea should take an active part in this endeavor so that these ideas bear fruits. As President Park emphasized, Korean unification would be an immeasurable bonanza for any nation with interest in the Korean Peninsula. Unification on the Korean Peninsula will contribute not only to the prosperity of Korea, but also to the peace and prosperity of Northeast Asia and the rest of the world. A peaceful and unified Korea that is free from the fear of war will be a catalyst for economic development of the Northeast Asia. Since German unification in 1990, East Germany has emerged from a backwater into a gross engine of the European economy. That is a powerful testimony to tremendous potential of Korean unification. At this conference, policymakers and experts from the United States and Korea have joined today to discuss ways to pre prepare for the unification. I ask all of you to gather your wisdom to make Korean unification come earlier for the prosperity of the world beyond Northeast Asia. I hope today's conference would serve as an opportunity for all of us to understand each other better and build friendships. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kong. It's now my pleasure to introduce uh, Ambassador An Ho Young, who will provide us some um, opening remarks for the conference. Ambassador An, as you all know, is the Republic of Korea's ambassador here in Washington. He joined the foreign ministry in 1978 and has held a number of posts, distinguished posts, throughout his career, most recently as first vice minister for foreign affairs and trade at the ministry. Uh, prior to this, he was ambassador to Belgium uh, as head of the, U as, of the Korean mission to the European Union and was appointed Deputy Minister for Trade at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade from 2008 to 2011, where he was what was known as the Sherpa for G20 and G8 outreach uh, meetings. Uh, he's held a number of important positions, but the most important thing in his bio is that he's a graduate of the Edmund A. Walsh School of Foreign Service at Georgetown <laughs> University. So, Ambassador An, thank you for joining us this morning. Good morning. There's no response? Good morning. How are you? 
Well, I guess maybe this is too early in the morning, <laughs> right? So in order to wake you up, I think I will start with an analogy from the world of sports. And in the world of sports, uh, they have an expression which is dream team, right? Dream team. And I was just checking some data wh where it started from. And I came to find that dream team started with basketball teams, See, basketball. Dream teams started originally with basketball. And then it moved to football. And then it moved to wrestling. And then in Korea, it moved to archery, right? So it is spreading. Dream teams are spreading, which is a good thing. Why do I tell you about dream team? It's because I just went through the list of speakers for today's seminar, and I said, this is a dream team. See? If you want to form a dream team of Asian experts, I said to myself, you don't have to go too far. I'm looking at you, the members of the dream team. And I said to myself, if you want a dream team of Asian experts, you can come to CSIS this morning, right? So that's the reason why I'm telling you about this uh, sports analogy of dream team. But dream team, they have a task for today, which is to discuss about unification, unification of Korea. And when it comes to unification, then uh, I think uh, there is one proposition in which I strongly believe in. And then I guess in this hall, there will be many of you who would be sharing the same proposition with me, which is, it is not a question of if. It's a question of when. It will happen eventually, but we do not know when. And what should we be doing today? We know it is going to happen, but we do not know when. So what are we supposed to do today? That, I think, would be a question which is in your mind all the time, and then there is a question in my mind all the time as well. So I guess maybe I can think of at least three things that we should be doing today in order to promote the process of unification, as well as in order to be, we will be better prepared when it eventually happens. So I guess maybe uh, at least there would be three things we could be doing together, even today. First thing in my mind, would be understanding, better understanding about what unification means. And then earlier today, Victor Cha, he was talking about it could be risky, it could be dangerous, it could be costly. And I agree with everything that Victor, Victor said. And then I always do. I agree with everything that Victor says. So when, when Victor told us about risky, expensive, costly, et cetera, et cetera, then, then I have to admit that I agree with him. But at the same time, we in fact have to, have to think about all the benefits which will be accruing from unification. And then both uh, Victor as well as Dr. Kang, they talked about economic benefits. And then on top of it, there will be security benefits. And on top of it, these days we are talking more and more about humanitarian benefits. But at the same time, there is no assurance. I mean, they, it, will be, they will, it will be costly, it will be risky, but at the same time, there can be benefits. But at the same time, nothing is, uh, is uh, written in the concrete. As a matter of fact, it will depend upon us how costly it will be. It, it will depend upon us how risky it could be. But at the same time, it will depend upon, upon us how beneficial it could be. So that's the first thing we should be doing, which is better understanding about what unification means for each and every one of us. The second, second action we could be taking, taking even today would be to strengthen engagement between Korea, between South Korea and North Korea. I know, again, it is not easy. Well, it is not easy today. It has not been easy for the past 70 years. And then it has not been easy because of ideological differences, because of the Korean War, because of weapons of mass destruction, because of all those unnecessary provocations. I, I define it unnecessary, unnecessary provocations. And then all of them made it difficult for us to engage North Korea. But even then, engagement is something necessary. And then there is the reason, uh, as Victor has already stated, uh, president Park, my president, she made a speech at Dresden, and in the Dresden speech, I think my president mentioned at least three points, which is humanitarian exchanges, 
and at the same time building of some infrastructure, economic infrastructure, as well as some uh, cultural exchanges. And then all of them, to the extent we can do it today, and then to the extent that through the process of uh, trust building process, we in fact should be extending the scope and contents of uh, exchanges between South and North Korea. So in my mind, that will be the second thing we can and we must do today. And then the third thing which I think we can do today would be uh, engagement, engagement with countries around the world with interest in the unification of Korea. And then why do I say that? It's because when we talk about this issue of unification, we often talk about lesson of Germany. And then Dr. Kang, he, he has already mentioned about lesson of Germany. And I think one lesson of Germany would be the importance of engagement with countries with deep interest in the unification process. So that, I think, these three, I think, are the things which we can do, we must do, in order to promote the process of unification, and at the same time, so that we'll be better prepared when the day comes, we, in fact, end up with a unified Korea. So better understanding, that's something we can do. And more engagement between South and North Korea, that's something we can do. And engagement with the countries with deep interest in Korea, uh, in the unification of Korea, that's something we can do. But the one last point I should be making with respect to the third point, that is to say, engagement with the countries with uh, interest in uh, the unification of Korea. That is to say, again, I'm getting back to this German unification. And at the time, people were saying, well, German unification, it in fact was the success or outcome of something called Ostpolitik, right? But at the same time, there were far more people who were saying it was not so much Ostpolitik, but Westpolitik, which in fact was at the end of the day, did so much for the German unification. So that I think is, would be another, uh, say, uh, the lesson we could be learning out of uh, German, German uh, precedent. But uh, let me be, I think I can afford to be brief today. Why? Because as I told you, these issues we are going to discuss all day long. By whom? By the dream team of, of Asian experts. So thank you so much and then look forward to our seminar today. Thank you. So if I could ask uh, the members of the first panel to come up on the stage and we'll get started right away. Thank you. Everybody mic'd up? So. mic'd up? Okay, so our um, uh, first two panels this morning are actually on the economics and business side with regard to unification. Uh, the first panel is on the economic synergy effect of unification on the Korean Peninsula. Our presenters, as you see in your program, are uh, Marcus Nolan, Dr. Kim Dong Soo. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Uh, Chen Hyung Gun and uh, Matt Goodman from CSIS. Their full bios are in the packet, so I'm not going to um, spend a lot of time uh, introducing them to you. Um, let me just say that they're all very distinguished people. As Ambassador Ron said, they're the dream team. Um, and the order that we're going in is uh, first uh, Mark Marcus Nolan, Executive Vice President and Director of Studies at the Peterson Institute for International Economics and a senior fellow for the East-West Center. Uh, Mark? I want to speak from here or from there? Uh, from here is fine. OK. Unless you'd like to use the podium. I would actually there. prefer to use Go it. Ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yep. Yeah. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be invited to address this group. I find that especially in the morning, I'm a little bit more energetic and active if I'm standing up rather than sitting down. <laughs> Um, 
I've always wanted to be, uh, my secret dream is I've always wanted to be 6'9 and play power forward in the NBA. Uh, so I suppose this is the closest I'm ever going to get to being a member of the dream team. <laughs> uh, the United States has a strong uh, economic and political interest in seeing Korea unified as a democratic capitalist state. The specifics of US involvement are partly contingent on a unification scenario. Excluding the horrific possibility of war, unification scenarios basically come down to uh, two a protracted consensual process in which North Korea maintains sovereignty for some significant transitional period and an abrupt uh, collapse and absorption scenario along the lines of the German experience. Earlier this year, the Ilmen uh, Institute of International Relations surveyed 135 experts, and I use the term experts advisedly uh, in this context, uh, the consensus coming out of this group, or at least the modal response of these uh, experts, was that the life expectancy of the Kim Jong-un regime was something on the order of 10 to 20 years. A majority, 64%, expected the regime to fall uh, through an internal power struggle, and that unification with the South would be the final endpoint of that process. This implies that the consensus of these experts tends towards that second abrupt uh, collapse and absorption scenario. Now, with respect to that scenario, as the United States uh, learned, has learned quite painfully uh, in Afghanistan and Iraq, um, the establishment of civil order is absolutely critical. If there were prolonged violent opposition to South Korean rule, uh, a quarantine or something akin to the Israel West Bank Gaza situation could emerge on the Korean Peninsula, which would obviously impede economic recovery. Um, rapid clarification of property rights uh, will be essential under either scenario. Without clarification of property rights, there won't be investment. And without investment, there won't be recovery. And uh, although I don't want to go into detail on this in the interest of time, but I'm happy to discuss it in question and answers, uh, I think that a lot, some of the most important lessons of the German case have been um, uh, miscomprehended or ignored. Specifically, that issue of clarification of property rights. The Germans pursued restitution. That slowed up the process of clarifying property rights and then getting investment. And the second and the bigger thing, which I think is, is, is generally misunderstood, it is, is that um, the monetary conversion rate at the time of unification was not the primary cause for the collapse of output in East Germany. Uh, it was the subsequent behavior of East German wages, and that was very much a product of German policy. If there's interest in this, I'm happy to, to discuss it further in uh, question and answer. The good news is that our Korean unification would accelerate peninsular growth and lead to a dramatic uh, reduction in poverty. The bad news is the price tag could easily exceed $1 trillion, uh, or something on the order of 100% of annual uh, GDP. Estimates of the impact on the United States economy vary widely. The key issue is the extent of reform in North Korea. Ironically, from an, from an analytical standpoint, it's actually easier to do the analysis in the uh, collapse and absorption scenario because, you, um, uh, because existing sanctions legislation and things like that become moot because North Korea has disappeared as a sovereign state. Um, the other thing about unification from the United States standpoint is the United States can contribute to financing unification, but I want to emphasize that the role of the private sector will be absolutely crucial, and that's the topic, I think, of the second session we're going to have. Uh, the U.S. public sector can do uh, a fair amount, but private sector involvement is really what is going to be decisive. So what are our starting points? Well, I'm going to, uh, as a good economist, assume away mass violence. I'm going to assume that whatever this process, whether it be consensual or a collapse, if it's a collapse, it's more like the East German collapse where there's not violent uh, opposition. Um, human capital in North Korea may be lower than expected. There is considerable evidence that the educational system has deteriorated quite substantially over the last 20 years. Environmental degradation uh, is likely to be extensive and may be quite expensive to clean up, especially if South Korean environmental standards are applied. Um, and the implication for North Korea, and this is more important under this kind of prolonged consensual unification scenario, is that the growing centrality of the mining sector uh, is associated throughout the world, but specifically in transitional economies, with um, 
sort of corrupt um, uh, familial-based autocracies that are evident in parts of Central Asia today. Uh, and, and that's sort of the trajectory that North Korea is on. Uh, it's not a particularly good, pretty picture. Now, the good news is that North Korea has South Korea. One cannot imagine a better asset to have uh, in, in the process of unification than South Korea as a partner. North Korea's population is a bit younger than uh, South Korea, so that should help. Um, my survey evidence that was reported in a, a paper that was released earlier this year by the U.S. Korea Institute at SICE suggests a relatively uh, reasonably disciplined and productive labor force in North Korea. Um, and there are pockets of excellence, though sadly these tend to be in things like missiles. Um, in terms of the economics of absorption, uh, product, market product market integration between North and South Korea would not have a big impact on South Korea. Think about Mexico integrating with the United States in NAFTA or a small European country joining the EU. It may affect specific communities, it may affect specific firms, or maybe even specific industries. But from a macroeconomic standpoint, North Korea is simply too small if all that integrates is product markets. The, the issue changes dramatically when we allow factor market integration and uh, implicitly allow people to cross the DMZ and labor markets to start to integrate between the two countries and obviously investment going from South Korea to uh, uh, North Korea. My own work based on multi-sectoral computable general equilibrium models suggests that uh, among the key issues are the uh, rapidity of tra technological transfer upgrading and productivity increase. Obviously, the faster productivity ramps up in North Korea, the lower the ultimate price tag will be for unification. How much labor migrates from North to South, uh, how much capital will be invested in the North, how much of that comes from South Korea, how much comes from third parties, is it uh, capital that is invested on a profit-seeking basis, or is it a grant aid? Um, as I indicated, uh, my work suggests that over a decade, the cost of unification defined as the amount of capital investment needed to raise North Korean incomes to 60% that of those in the South would exceed a trillion dollars, which is, a, which is in the, roughly in the same ballpark uh, as the figure put out earlier this year uh, by the South Korean Ministry of Finance. It would have distributional implications in South Korea as well. There would be a shift in the distribution of income from labor to capital and within labor from relatively low-skilled labor to relatively high-skilled labor. So absent compensatory policies by the South Korean government, the process of economic integration would be accompanied by widening wealth and, and uh, uh, income inequality. There are possibilities that different sectors of the economy, what, what we economists call traded goods versus non-traded goods, would be affected differentially. Uh, South Korea would not be hurt in absolute terms. I want to make this quite clear though the growth rate in South Korea would slow. The peninsular growth rate overall, however, would accelerate. And as I mentioned, there would be a dramatic reduction in poverty. Um, it seems to me that the policy implications for South Korea are that um, engagement to encourage as much transformation as possible within North Korea as a precondition to reconciliation and eventual unification is desirable. Uh, South Korea ought to be running a budget surplus uh, to basically put away money for uh, eventual unification costs. There is a need to strengthen the Korean Fair Trade Commission to make sure that anti-competitive practices are not practiced in North Korea as they were in East Germany uh, post-unification. Uh, in terms of the monetary union, the Bank of Korea ought to be working very diligently to understand what the North Korean real exchange rate is and as I mentioned in the case of Germany, focus on wage setting not the initial conversion rate. That's where the German uh, case went wrong. And then possibly most critically, uh, it is essential to clarify property rights quickly in order to get investment. Um, what you want is compensation, not restitution. If people have claims on property in North Korea, they can be compensated, but you don't want them to get tied up in some legal process in which the, the, the ownership rights of the assets are unclear and the asset deteriorates. So compensation, uh, not restitution, and owners of capital with skin in the game to restrain wages. Uh, land to the tiller, that is to say, gives North Korean farmers the land that they're currently uh, operating so they can continue to do it. It will increase productivity and reduce the incentives to migrate. And uh, while you will ultimately want to see privatization of assets, this has to be done very carefully so that it doesn't become a fire sale, as happened in the case of Germany. 
For the United States, um, which of these two basic scenarios obtains, whether it be the prolonged consensual unification process or a more abrupt process, um, uh, matters. Um, successful rehabilitation of the North Korean economy under either scenario will lead to an expansion of trade with the United States. That will largely consist of North Korea shipping light manufacturers to the United States in return for capital goods and agricultural products. Um, other products that North Korea produces, such as metals, may well be purchased by US firms for assembly operations, for example, in the electronic sector elsewhere in Asia. So they might be considered indirect uh, imports by the United States. Uh, there would be an expansion of uh, uh, services trade as well, basically business services exports from the United States to North Korea and North Korea exporting tourism services uh, uh, to the United States. Um, one issue that, could, that w might be different under the two scenarios, in the kind of protracted scenario where North Korea remains sovereign for some considerable period of time, labor standards issues uh, may become uh, quite important, at least from the standpoint of the United States investors. Um, U.S. interaction with North Korea today is constrained by a dense web of sanctions and other measures. In the consensual uh, scenario, those may require both uh, executive and or congressional action for their removal. And I think this is important for South Korean audience to understand. Even if there is an improvement in relations between Seoul and Pyongyang, it doesn't automatically follow that the United States is going to start, start changing its laws with respect to North Korea. Um, that would not be such a big deal in the collapse and absorption scenario because those measures would effectively become moot. In either event, um, the uh, um, annex in the chorus agreement, annex 22B in the chorus agreement, could be used to jumpstart American uh, interaction with uh, North Korea. Um, uh, in, if you have, for example, in the case of Germany, the brief period where the German Social Democrats ran the, uh, the East German government under the final prime minister, uh, Lothar de Maziar. Um, in terms of finance, as I indicated, unification is likely to be expensive. There is a role for the US to play both uh, bilaterally and through the international financial institutions. Um, the capacity of the United States government to contribute to this process is going to partly be a function of US fiscal position. Uh, and the US fiscal position over the next 20 to 10 to 20 years is highly uncertain. Um, but I want to emphasize that unification finance should not be thought of strictly as a public sector activity. Indeed, the private sector will have a critical role to play as well. Um, probably the most important US economic contribution to the process is likely to come through the private sector. Foreign direct investment, which is the topic of our next session, uh, constitutes the institutional mechanism for both technology transfer and the links to the marketing and distribution networks globally that North Korea currently lacks. The basic problem with the North Korean economy is you have a certain amount of latent potential, but they literally do not have the nerve synapses to connect that latent potential to the global market. And that's where foreign direct investment will be so critical. And, and that's where US involvement uh, really will have an impact. In that context, aid should seek to complement, not substitute, for those uh, private sector activities, and indeed uh, should try to be uh, oriented in a way to, in fact, encourage uh, uh, additional uh, private sector uh, uh, financial inflows. I thank you for your attention, and I look forward to our subsequent discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Marcus. Um, speaking next is Dr. Kim Dong Su. Dr. Kim Dong Su is the director of the Research Planning and Coordination Division uh, at the Korean Institute for Industrial Economics and Trade. Uh, he received his PhD in economics just down the street here at George Washington University. Dr. Kim, please, please. Good morning. Uh, actually, I'm more than happy to join the Dream Team. This morning. <laughs> it is a really honor to present my paper here. And actually, I prepared the slide, you could see. This morning, I'm going to talk about the uh, 
economic synergy effect of unification. But uh, before I doing that, uh, actually, I'm going to talk about the premises of the economic integration first, and then I will go over the synergy effects uh, by industrial sectors, and I will try to conclude. Uh, especially before I start, uh, I'm going to introduce myself a little bit because uh, I'm from the Institute, Korean Institute of uh, Industrial Economics and Trade. That's one of the 23 uh, economic uh, research institutes under the Prime Minister's office, under the provision of NRCS. Uh, Kiev actually uh, mainly focus on the industrial policies to the Ministry of uh, uh, Industry, Energy, and Trade in Korea. Uh, in order to in order to discuss the economic impact of uh, uh, unification, actually, we need to think about the uh, economic integration. Uh, sometimes I'm quite uh, not sure about which, uh, I mean, conceptually, I'm a little bit confused. Uh, in, in economic integration seems like a, a bigger concept than uh, unification. Uh, probably this morning I'm going to uh, mess up the terminology in between economic integration and uh, unification. Please forgive me. Uh, the path of uh, unification uh, is really determined the initial condition of North Korean economy. Uh, that's why the speed and uh, course of economic integration or unification is really important, uh, not only for co two Koreas, but also the neighbor countries such as uh, China and Japan. Uh, there are so many uh, literatures uh, Think about the process of unification. Maybe uh, uh, two processes possible, gradual, gradual unification and radical unification. As you can see, uh, gradual unification, that might be the ideal case. Uh, right after uh, significant economic growth of uh, uh, North Korea, I mean the overall uh, in North Korean economy, then uh, we may have a unification but uh, it is hard to achieve that, I believe. Uh, when we think about the economic integration, probably that might be more realistic. I mean, the case of radical unification. Uh, maybe still there are two possible uh, situations, and one is intermediate and complete economic integration, and the other one is gradual and partial economic integration. And in order to talk about the economic synergy effect, uh, I need uh, some kind of a premises of uh, economic integration. The first one, uh, after the economic integration, North Korea uh, supposed to immediately adopt a market economy. And then second one, uh, after the unification, still there's supposed to be wage disparity between two Koreas, otherwise, really difficult to think about the integration. Uh, let me move on to the synergy effect. Uh, I believe uh, I'm the more oriented in economics uh, rather than international relations or politics uh, this morning, I believe. Uh, right before uh, the uh, synergy effect I'm going to talk about the Korean economic, South Korean economic situation first. Uh, we do, we face this in challenges. Uh, as you can see, we do have a strong neighborhoods. Probably you may hold that uh, sandwich uh, theories, uh, maybe uh, mentioned by the CEO of Samsung, uh, Lee Gun Hee. He uh, initiated that uh, terms, sandwiches, in 1992, I believe because uh, Korea looks, South Korea looks like a sandwich right in between uh, China and Japan. Uh, we believe uh, the technology disparity, technology gap between South Korea and China has been uh, lessening while the technology gap between South Korea and Japan is widening. That's uh, what we face right now. A lot of uh, 
industrial experts, uh, my colleagues in my institutes, they really worry about that. And uh, the other one is we are one of the fa uh, fastest aging society. As you can see on the right hand side, there is a population distribution by ages. Uh, 40s and 50s, I'm right middle of the 40. Uh, I was born in 1969. Uh, 40s and 50s almost double comparing to the teenagers and under 10s in South Korea. Uh, uh, right hand side, that's the population distribution in 2010. Uh, the shape of the pyramid looks very, very unbalanced. We are uh, going to be problematic in next 20, 30 years. Uh, lack of the, the production labor, uh, production uh, labor forces. Uh, as I told you, like uh, we are facing, um, we are sort of a deadlock in the industry side. Uh, comparing to the 1995, 2012, the structure, industrial structure, still doesn't change much. Uh, as you can see, steel sectors, automobile, petrol refineries, and chemicals and machineries are the main uh, key manufacturing industries in Korea. We we didn't move much to the IT sectors, even though we are famous for that. Potentiality of North Korea is uh, pretty uh, rosy to us. Actually, they have abundant resources, not only for the uh, natural resources, but also the human capitals. Uh, as you can see, the first table, uh, uh, the Bank of Korea, according to the Bank of Korea, uh, the coals and irons are abundant, and the infrastructure of uh, uh, railroad, the infra uh, transportation uh, infrastructure. I know the quality is pretty poor, but uh, still, the length of railroads are uh, pretty uh, uh, abundant, a, a lot uh, bigger than uh, South Korea. The second table, actually showing the labor cost in Kaesong, uh, which is about $1,500 uh, of uh, annual income. Comparing to the Beijing or Qingdao or Jakarta, that's a lot lower. So we may use that uh, uh, lower labor force if we have unification or with the uh, wage differences. Overall, effect of uh, unification is pretty uh, prosperous, not only for the Korea, but also uh, Northeast region. Uh, there might be a mutual uh, benefits in, in neighborhoods. Uh, I believe the po political stability in Han Peninsula will bring the, uh, some energy, uh, synergy effects in manufacturing, logistics, and energies, etc. Also, we could think about the, the energy and transportation in uh, Northeast Asia. Probably we could think about the transcontinent railroad from Tokyo to London. Also, there might be some network gas pipeline in Northeast Asia, etc. So that might be, uh, that may bring the multilateral cooperation in economic blocks in Northeast country. I believe it, it will bring more business opportunities in, uh, I guess, at least uh, 50 years. Uh, absolutely, we need to rebuild North Korea. Uh, that will uh, cause the uh, backward induction, uh, backward uh, industrial linkages. That uh, investment demand will bring the more opportunities in uh, Northeast Asia, I believe. Let me go just uh, over uh, sector by sector uh, briefly. Uh, I believe unification will trigger the industrial restructuring in Korea. Uh, there might be 
a really a enhancement in the a labor intensive industries such as uh, machineries and uh, inter uh, uh, machineries and textiles and electrics and chemicals, etc. Also, there is uh, some uh, potentiality in the IT sectors because I don't know uh, how they educate people, but uh, their IT software skills, uh, technologies are uh, pretty outstanding. They, their, I mean, the North Korean hacking skills are uh, uh, one of the top, as, as you know. So we may use uh, that kind of technology in the reunified Korea. Uh, South Korea is losing the competitiveness in steel industries. That's a sort of a traditional manufacturing sectors because of the e, e higher labor cost. For example, uh, the average uh, labor forces AG in uh, steel industry is over 45 years old. Uh, we lose the productivity. Actually, China already passed South Korea. But if we can use the uh, no, uh, labor force in North Korea with uh, uh, relatively lower uh, labor cost, then uh, we could still have uh, uh, competitiveness. Also, we could use a lot of uh, natural resources in North Korea, too. Uh, Chemicals. Uh, we could think about, we could imagine the uh, vertical integration in chemicals. In Korea, uh, refineries and uh, petrochemicals are very uh, uh, prospected, but uh, again, uh, the same thing happened in these sectors uh, with uh, higher labor f uh, cost. Also, we could think about the transportation machineries and transportation equipment, such as automobile uh, facilities, production facilities. Uh, we could uh, make North Korea as a hub for the Chinese market. Uh, I believe there might be a huge benefit uh, rather than going abroad. I mean, uh, probably you may know that Hyundai had a seven uh, production uh, factories in uh, all over the world, except the South Korea. So we could uh, just build up uh, one for Chinese market in North Korea too. Machineries, high techs, maybe you can see uh, uh, the slide. Let me go to the uh, environment issues. Uh, probably there might be a serious environment deterioration in North Korea. This will bring, I believe, more opportunity uh, in invest, to invest. Also, aerospace and defense industrial sector, that's also one uh, the rosy sector. Uh, yeah, uh, the technology in that sector in North Korea is also uh, worldwide uh, very uh, high level. And uh, the tenth, the last one, services sectors, uh, that's the uh, most underdeveloped in North Korea. But uh, uh, we could think about the, the business opportunity also. Uh, probably we, we need to build up the financial systems and uh, commercials, logistics, and a lot of uh, business services and uh, manufacturing services should be established in North Korea. Uh, that will uh, give us uh, more opportunity. Uh, let me conclude. It is really difficult to uh, think about the synergy effect of unification without uh, uh, real data. If there is a real data, but still we cannot trust that uh, data. Uh, official data uh, of North Korea is very limited. Bank of Korea just provide a small number of uh, statistics, but uh, that's not that reliable. 
uh, even uh, census data uh, of North Korea is a lot uh, outdated, and we cannot trust that. So uh, many uh, expectations of uh, scenarios are quite uh, limited, I believe. Uh, but uh, there is a still potentiality of industrial cooperation between two Korea is quite massive because uh, two Korea is a totally complement uh, in terms of the factor endowment. So there might be a huge benefit uh, if we can uh, unify. Um, again, uh, like Samsung moved their mobile production to the Vietnam and they moved the semiconductor production uh, to Xi'an in China. If we can use North Korea as a broad production site, that will uh, give us a lot of uh, opportunity, chance. And uh, in Korea, South Korea right now, because of the higher labor force, labor cost, uh, we uh, opened to the uh, foreign workers. Actually, uh, they could work in uh, South Korea in three years, and there are a lot of also uh, illegal workers, foreign workers in Korea. If we can use uh, North Korean labor force, that will be, will be uh, pretty beneficial, I, I guess. This is my personal um, expectation. The synergy effect of unification uh, is not a matter of how, but the matter of a possibility. Absolutely, the cost of unification at the first stage will be huge, while the benefits are going to be uh, increasing. But I believe a generation over two, in, in a generation over two, then the cost will be all gone, but the benefits will be perpetual, I believe. Uh, unification is going to give us a very good opportunity. Uh, I believe about, uh, that's not feasible in the long run. I was born in 1969. A lot of people asked me, do you really want unification? Yes, I do. Are you ready to pay for that? Well, I don't know. Probably my daughter, uh, she will never pay that cost. So we need to really prepare for the unification pretty soon. And unified Korea will have a, a 75 million of a population. That's pretty good numbers. Actually, actually slightly bigger than uh, UK and France. Uh, but slightly lower than, smaller than uh, German. I think 75 million of uh, uh, unified Korea has really a potential, uh, potentiality. But there is a, a lot of uh, obstacles against the unification. Again, uh, generation gaps exist. Probably next generation, they don't care much about the unification. Plus, uh, there are a lot of stakeholders for the unification, neighbor country, Japan, China. I don't think they really want unified Korea in terms of the industrial competitiveness. And the most ideal way to unify, I believe, that will be the economic exchange first uh, with the industrial cooperation. We hope that uh, North Korea just uh, becomes like China in 1970s and 80s. Uh, we hope that uh, North Korea opened their economy. Uh, then we could just uh, exchange our industrial cooperation, then unified, and then uh, we hope to achieve the full-fledged economic integration. Thank you for listening. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Kim. Um, and so we have two discussants for the panel who will offer some brief remarks. Uh, first is Dr. Uh, Chung Hyun Gun, who is a Vice President of uh, the Korea Institute for International Economic Policy. 
He also formerly served as Director General at the Office of Strategy Planning at the National Security Council Blue House from June 2003 to December 2005. Uh, Dr. Zhang, please. Thank you very much for your kind introduction, Dr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let me first express my sincere appreciation to CSIS for the effort in making this joint seminar possible. Uh, it was very interesting for me to hear the two presentations on the economic synergy effect of Korean unification from different point of view, and I would like to first thank the two presenters for the insightful presentations. Instead of addressing the each presenter, uh, I would first like to make a general comment. After that, I would like to raise some questions. So recently, uh, there has been a wide-ranging and active analysis of the economic uh, effect of the Korean unification following the uh, recent statement by President Park Geun-hye, who described the Korean unification as a bonanza. Despite their diversity, recent publications and analysis point to a common conclusion that the unified Korea would experience rapid economic growth and would provide a full up effect with respect to global demands, the result of which would be beneficial not only for the uh, South Korea's neighboring countries, such as the United States, Japan, China, and Russia, but for the global economy as a whole. It appears that both Dr. Bo uh, Nolan and Dr. Kim have reached a similar conclusion in that, although uh, there is a whole range of benefit that could be expected from the Korean unification, the most significant would be the two Koreans forming an effective regime in terms of labor, uh, division of labor and cooperation, thus achieving uh, economies of scale. Especially, North Korea can improve its total factor productivity by taking uh, advantage of the capital goods from the South Korea and foreign countries that possess advanced technologies. <laughs> Additionally, this would bring North Korea closer to South Korea's cost input structure and raise uh, North Korea's input output coefficient to the level similar to that of the South Korea, leading to the resolution of inefficiencies associated with the cost input in North Korea. So Dr. Nolan described and outlined this process very clearly by utilizing the factor market integration. The positive effects and benefits generated from the Korean unification would no doubt benefit uh, both Koreas. However, the people of North Korea would receive the greatest share of those benefits. The extent of the, those benefits might vary depending on the form of unification, but any form of uni unification not involving war will lead to exponential growth of North Korea's GDP and growth in wages and real consumption among the North Korean population. Trade by North Korea with other countries would also grow by leaps and bounds, and its industry structure would undergo the rapid transformation. Another added benefit for North Korea is, uh, in the event of the uh, unification with South Korea is that North Korea also becomes a beneficiary of the FTAs. South Korea has concluded with other many countries. Countries currently trading with South Korea also stand to reap economic gains from the unification of the Korean Peninsula. By diversifying the scenarios for the unification and the conducting the CG analysis for them, just Dr. Nolan uh, did in, a, uh, in his previous studies, we can determine the potential GDP changes for South and North Korea in each scenario. And if we expand the range of our analysis and include the United States, Japan, China, and Russia. And we can calculate the GDP for those uh, major countries as well. This is exactly what it did at our institution recently. And we have found that the level of gain for each country differs depending on the pace and direction of the given scenarios. As a whole, however, it is discovered that all four of our neighboring countries eventually benefited from the Korean unification. Then again, the biggest winner, perhaps, from the unification is inarguably the people of North Korea. And it is urgent and very important that we let them know. It is exactly to emphasize this urgency that President Park Geun-hye described the unification as a bonanza. And she reiterated and added to her point when she visited Dresden uh, this past May, stating that Korean unification is bonanza not just for Korea, but all countries in the Northeast Asian countries. 
The next logical step for President Park Geun-hye is to make a strong push for the argument that the unification represents the biggest bonanza for the people of North Korea. At this point, I would like to remind everyone that the unification cannot happen through the effort of South Korea alone. It is something uh, that is only possible when the people of North Korea respond positively, and only then will the unification become a bonanza for everyone in the Korean Peninsula. So it is crucial that we impress upon the North Korean people the benefit of unification into the North, and this is a point that cannot be understated. There's one more point that I would like to raise concerning the unification issue. So I would like to point out that there has been a lot of discussions on the cost and benefit of unification, but in relative terms, there has not been much debate on which scenario perhaps represents the most effective policy for the unification. So my question for our presenter actually revolve around this point. Uh, Dr. Nolan and Kim have analyzed the economic effect of different scenarios for the Korean unification. So my question is, which of those scenarios represent the most effective form of unification economically? Which one is the, the best when uh, considering the existing political and social limitations in South and North Korea? And what are the, some of the policies that the South Korean government would need to implement in order to bring about the unification in accordance with those scenarios? So ladies and gentlemen, that about those for my comment and question. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Um, uh, and our fourth discussant uh, for the panel today, this morning, is uh, Matthew Goodman. Matt Goodman holds the William E. Simon Chair in Political Economy at CSIS. He was formerly the White House Coordinator for APEC and the East Asia Summit, and served as Director of Asian Affairs, uh, Asian Economic Affairs on the National Security Council. So, Matt, thank you, Victor, us. Um, and I'm really honored to be up here um, to extend the sports metaphors. Um, I'm a big baseball fan, and as you can probably tell from my rather anxious and uh, bleary-eyed <laughs> look, I'm a Washington Nationals fan, so it's a very anxious uh, time. But I feel a little like a, a rookie up here coming to bat after some, uh, some Hall of Fame uh, sluggers have just, uh, just gone up. Um, I have not done the same kind of deep analysis of, um, of this subject as, as these gentlemen. And so I think my um, comments will be largely as a sort of layman looking at this in a, from a sort of common sense point of view and trying to um, reinforce probably some of the points they're making and, and maybe ask a couple of questions. Um, and and I, I guess I would start by just asking the audience for a little empathy for everybody up here because there are, uh, this is an incredibly hard subject to, uh, to try to analyze. Economic analysis is always, and prognostication is always very difficult. But I think here you've got a lot of known and unknown unknowns, uh, including uh, what's going on in North Korea, which is truly unknown to all of us. And I think we have to admit that, um, certainly from an economic perspective. Um, you know, we don't know what the nature of this transition might be and when it's going to start and, and how it's going to proceed. Um, so it's very hard to do any sort of economic analysis and that kind of, with that kind of moving target. Um, and of course, we don't know what the dynamic effects might be, positive or negative, um, in, in, in that transition. So I just you know, start by prefacing all this by saying this is a really difficult uh, task for all of us. Um, but broadly speaking, I think you know, I would say that it, it's, it's, I think, right to think that there will be economic synergy if uh, there's a, a transition uh, to ultimate reunification of the peninsula. Um, or at least I'd say yes, but. Um, yes, certainly the complementarity of the two economies and their resource endowments, uh, you know, with the North having uh, minerals and, and cheap labor and, and, and starting from such a low base. The South, you know, having capital technology, um, sophisticated, efficient markets, uh, you know, suggests that there is an opportunity here for, for real long-term um, uh, synergy. Um, uh, and people smarter than me at you know, Goldman Sachs have you know, said that there's a possibility this could be a, ultimately an economy that is more competitive, larger and more competitive than, you know, than Germany. Um, and certainly so as a, as a theoretical and a longer term proposition, I think clearly there is synergy. Uh, but again, there are a lot of, a lot of unknowns here. Um, 
as has been alluded to by the previous speakers, uh, you know, we don't know the real condition of North Korean labor stock, capital stock, um, could be much weaker than, than we think. Um, again, dynamic effects of a sudden collapse and absorption, if that is the, the, the principal scenario here, in particular with that scenario, um, including sort of migration effects and everything that are very uncertain. Um, and then, uh, you know, the UN has noted that, that these two economies are the, uh, have the largest gap in income of any two countries sharing a border anywhere in the world. So there's never been, a, there's no precedent for bringing together uh, two such uh, widely divergent uh, economies in terms of um, uh, uh, income. So, um, so I think we have to be honest that we don't know exactly um, uh, how that synergy is going to be created and, and even whether it will in, in some specific respects. So I, I think you know, the, the other piece that, of course, everybody's touched on is, is, the, is the German example and how much that's relevant. And I just thought I'd offer a few thoughts on that. I mean, I think clearly it's instructive, but, but, but clearly also there are limits to the German example as a, as a model. Um, and frankly, the experience of Germany is not entirely comforting either uh, from, from a Korean perspective. Um, you know, similarities, obviously, two economies that are, I mean, two populations roughly similar sized, 75 million. Um, you know, both cases you have a, you know, socialist command economy on one side supported by a large uh, neighbor uh, versus a, a dynamic market-based economy um, allied to the U.S. So there are, you know, obvious similarities in, in kind of the political economy in both places. Um, but the differences are also quite striking. You know, West Germany uh, had a population three to four times as large as East Germany's population, whereas in Korea, I think the ratio is about two to one. Um, so I think that by itself raises questions about you know, how this absorption will be similar or different. Um, you know, Korea obviously has been divided for nearly 70 years, whereas uh, the Germanys uh, were divided more like 40, 40 plus years. Um, and it feels like uh, things were converging in Germany uh, on a lot of levels and synapses were being correct, connected even before the wall fell in a way that doesn't seem to be happening in, in Korea. In fact, if anything, it seems to be in the last few years moving the other direction. Um, uh, and then importantly, you know, East Germany's GDP per capita was about one third of West Germany's at the start of the process. Um, whereas North Korea's is something like five or six percent of, uh, of South Korea's today. Um, so, you know, South Korea's, what, 15 to 20 times as large per capita income. Uh, so there's, you know, all of this suggests that as compared with Germany, this very well could be a much more challenging process. It could take a lot longer and be a lot more expensive. Um, and as I alluded to, you know, even the end point, the German experience is not yet totally finished. Uh, it's taken 25 years so far, it's not complete. You know, unemployment is still double, nearly double, I think, what it is in the East, uh, in the East to what it is in the West. Um, wages are only 70 to 80% of the West. Um, Western states are still paying, richer Western states are still paying st solidarity taxes to the Eastern uh, states. Um, and it's been estimated that the, um, you know, the total cost of the, the German process has been north of $2, tr $2 trillion uh, dollars, uh, to date and uh, still, uh, still accumulating. So I think there are, um, uh, you know, reasons to be uh, not necessarily comforted by the German experience, even if it is, um, if, even if it is, um, there, there are lessons there. Uh, but of course, the good news is that, every, that, that most Germans are much better off today uh, than in 1989. Um, you know, it was only 15 years before an East German was elected chancellor of, of, uh, all, of unified Germany. Um, uh, you know, Germany's become the political and economic center of gravity in, in uh, the European Union. So, I mean, there are a lot of reasons for, for thinking that that example, if it were analogous and on a model, would be, uh, would be ultimately positive um, for Korea. Okay, final uh, just thing to say is that you know, it is possible, on the other hand, that the trans this transition could be uh, not quite as painful as people think in practice. Um, I think it depends a lot on whether we're looking at the situation today where there's this huge gap that has to be closed over a certain period of time, or whether, you know, 
this, the, the process starts after a point of some convergence. Um, and so it really depends on what the starting point is. Although I must say, this does remind me of the, the old joke about the driver who's out in the countryside lost and stops and asks the farmer how to get to the town he's going to. And the farmer says, well, I wouldn't start from here. Um, so, uh, you know, so I admit we're, we're in the world we're in, but I do think it's possible that, you know, and these are more questions than predictions or, or analysis of what's going on for, for, for all of you who are experts about what may be going on in North Korea. You know, it's possible that even short of uh, some real uh, reform and opening in North Korea that leads to the more gradual um, uh, consensus, uh, consensual uh, unification, that you could have an improvement in living conditions in North Korea um, that would sort of raise that base and create a better precondition for, um, for unification. Um, and so whether some of the market-based reforms that may or may not be underway in SEZs or you know, through uh, these reports of uh, rising prices and construction boom in Pyongyang and everything, um, I mean, all that stuff feels like Potemkin Village stuff and, and not really real, but I wonder whether there are any, any improvements going on uh, within which could sort of close the gap even before, um, before the unification process. And then, of course, there's what we can all do to, uh, to help close that gap. And, and so uh, President Park's um, trust politique and the economic dimensions of that are, are, are interesting. And whether uh, the aid packages or uh, possibly new infra uh, cooperative infrastructure projects or even the people-to-people -people exchanges will in some way help close that gap in advance, I think those those things are uh, definitely interesting and would change, I think, the calculation about the, uh, the cost of the transition anyway. Um, you know, but all that said, I think there's good reason for caution about uh, what sort of internal reforms are going on in North Korea and, and, and about the ability of outsiders to really influence what's going on inside. So I don't mean to state, say that these, these things are going to um, dramatically change the situation. Um, I guess the only other point of comfort for obviously for our South Korean friends is that you know South Korea is not going to be alone in this. Um, uh, the, the U.S., Japan, other uh, other countries bilaterally are going to are going to support the the process of transition. Uh, international financial institutions, I think, as, as um, uh, Marcus alluded to, are going to are, are inevitably going to be involved. Um, and importantly, I would also very strongly endorse the point about the private sector that the private sector um, is going to be a critical uh, player here. And, uh, and in fact, policy today should be focused on trying to figure out how to uh, incentivize, how to support, uh, guarantee uh, business and private sector as it uh, moves in to a, a more, um, into a new situation if that happens. Um, so uh, economic synergy clearly there is a long-term uh, proposition. Uh, but a lot of unknowns, um, and if unification started today, I'd say it's it's going to be it's going to be bumpier and take longer and be more costly than I think we um, uh, than we think. Um, though you know, again, if it if if there were a, a change in the preconditions, it might be not so so uh, so painful. Um, and again, policy uh, should be focused on uh, on helping to ease this transition. So I will, uh, I will stop there. I may have a couple of questions afterwards for the, the two previous speakers, but I know Great. we're Thank behind you. schedule. So. Thanks, yeah. Matt. That, uh, that was fantastic. Thanks very much. Um, so we have um, about 15 minutes for discussion, question and answer. Um, uh, one question I would actually like to ask both of our speakers is, um, and it kind of follows from where Matt left off, the, Matt said that you know sometimes this thing may not be as painful as people think it does, but a lot of that will depend on the degree of, of economic reform that takes place in North Korea prior to whenever this happens. And so I, I guess the question to both of you is, do you think right now there is anything that you could call? I mean, if you had to try to point to something positive on the North Korean side in terms of economic policy, is there anything that you could point to as a sign of economic reform? Is there any piece that you would pick up as, you know, if we tried to take what Matt said, it may not be as bad as we think it is if there is something positive happening on the economic side inside the North. So is there anything positive happening on the economic side uh, inside of the North? So please add that to your list of 
uh, questions that you received from the, uh, the discussants as well. And then um, if there, we'll, maybe we'll take a couple from the floor before we go uh, back to our uh, speakers. Yes, sir. Please uh, identify yourself. My name is Jay Ru. I'm a retired professor of oh, Loyola University. I have, in, for the sake of time, I'll try to be very brief. Uh, thank you for a very illustrious and informative presentation. Dr. Nolan's uh, points, many points I'm in full agreement, that the land uh, ownership after unification must be dealt with with utmost care, and any property rights should be uh, claimed on the basis of compensation rather than restitution and so on. But there are two other points I want Dr. Nolan's comments on. One is uh, uh, strongly proposed by my friend who coined the word uh, unification was Bonanza about a year and a half before President Park mentioned it in January 6th this year in uh, 2012. 20, uh, unification is tabak, roughly translated, but not exactly conveyed by words like jackpot or Bonanza. He uh, argues two additional points uh, for the unification to be uh, to, uh, going in the, that desirable direction is that the investment in North Korean infrastructure building must be done through a policy of buy Korea policy. Most of the buildings of infrastructure, transportation, land, whatever, uh, electric power and so on, uh, the South Korean capital should be responsible for 80 or 90 percent of it. It will run into uh, hefty opposition. Uh, have you thought about such a proposal? And if you have or have not, what are your, what will be your comments? The other is uh, military expense that uh, South Koreans uh, spend about th over 3% of their GNP on uh, military. And my friends believe, and I strongly also agree, that upon unification, that it should be reduced to 1% about the rate that Japan is spending on their military expenditure. And also, uh, one question for Dr. Kim is uh, he, you mentioned, talked about the various uh, synergic effect from unification, and I uh, very much in favor of all of it. But you, and also talked about the difficulties of getting there. But what would be the conditions that would uh, make it possible for such synergic effects to take place? I, I'm sure you cannot get too much into details, but the sum of uh, conditions that will enable it. I'd be interested, and I'd like to support the discussion, Dr. Chung's comment, that whatever we do, it will be somehow uh, directed by one very strong principle, a parameter, that is, whatever we do for unification, the question is, will it contribute to the changing of public opinion of North Korean people, so that they will want to live like South Koreans, and they will want a one Korea. Uh, so I'd like to support that uh, statement, not without a question. Thank you very much. Um, great. Thank you, Professor. I, I, um, I heartily endorse that last comment that, yes, I mean, when we think about synergy, we often think about what it will mean for South Koreans, but the clearest, biggest winner, I think, is, uh, um, as was said on the panel, would be the North Korean people. Um, so I think that, that was four questions in one. So. <laughs> Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to now go back to our two uh, speakers to, you know, to pick and choose, address the questions that you'd like to address. Maybe we start with, uh, um, um, with uh, Marcus. Okay. Well, let me start with your question first, since it's sort of the broadest one. Uh, if I was asked to characterize North Korean uh, government attitudes towards uh, the economy, uh, I would say that uh, uh, North Korean attitude towards the economy is, one, uh, we want to be modern. We want cell phones. We want automobiles. We want intercontinental ballistic missiles. All the trappings of, of, of modern life. Um, two, we want to be prosperous. And three, we want it on our own terms. And this is the fundamental contradiction at the heart of North Korean economic policy. Now, that is not to say that North Korea is not changing. There has been an enormous expansion of trade with China, largely driven by minerals trade. Uh, as, one, as someone mentioned, there has been this proliferation of special economic zones. Um, so th there are aspects of change, but I would not say that uh, 
one, at least to my eyes, uh, I do not see any coherent reform strategy. Uh, I see a, a, a bunch of ad hoc measures. And indeed, I would say the trajectory that North Korea is on is towards a, uh, as I mentioned in my remarks, an increasingly resource uh, extraction centric economy, uh, highly uh, opaque, highly corrupt, generating benefits for a small group of politically connected insiders and not generating much benefit for the bulk of the population. And you already see this now in the widening gap between lifestyles in Pyongyang and the rest of the country. Uh, rising inequality where some segment of the population is actually doing okay, whereas uh, much of the population is le being left behind, if not actually going backwards. Now, to uh, Dr. Zhang's question about um, you know, what scenario represents um, the, um, the, uh, the best outcome. Uh, let me be slightly provocative here. Um, if I were a South Korean, I would go to bed every night praying for an East German style collapse of North Korea. Yeah. I, think, I think German unification gets a really bad rap. And the reason is this. Nobody got hurt. There was no mass violence. East Germany disappeared as smoothly as one can possibly imagine. And if you think about the nature of that East German regime, the police state of Stasi, and the fact that that just basically disappeared without any mass violence, without anyone getting hurt, yeah, it cost some money. And it's continued to cost some money. Some of that was unavoidable. Some of it was avoidable if you hadn't made policy mistakes. Uh, I think German unification was an enormous success. Now, when you ask, which is the preferable scenario, the problem is, if I say collapse and absorption, I can't guarantee that you're going to get a smooth disappearance of North Korea. Given the militarization of that society, given that virtually every adult male has military training, given nuclear weapons, uh, an abrupt collapse of that regime could be messy in the extreme. So I can't pick and choose among, among scenarios. What I can say is do what you can to s establish the necessary precursors for eventual unification while being prepared um, for the worst possible outcomes, recognizing that ultimately what happens on the Korean Peninsula is largely going to be a function of the, of the preferences and capacity of the North Korean leadership. As outsiders, we have a certain amount of ability to frame this environment. But ultimately, it is going to be the North Korean leadership's ability to manage the multiple stresses that that regime is, is under, which is going to determine um, what that final outcome is going to be. So what are the policy recommendations for South Korea? As I said, run a fiscal surplus. You need to put money away for the rainy day. Strengthen the Korean Fair Trade Commission. One of the problems in East Germany was West German corporations moved in, bought up East German assets, and literally shut them down because they were potential competitors or simply turned them into sales offices. The Chaebol are going to be the natural instrument for rehabilitating the North Korean economy, but you have to make sure the Chaebol behave responsibly. Uh, money, politics, nexus has always been a problem in South Korea. South Korea has made enormous strides in improving uh, business government relations over the last couple decades. The integration with North Korea is by its very nature going to be a highly politicized process and could send that into reverse. So you have to guard against that as well. Uh, as I mentioned in my remarks, establish a, pr a principle of compensation for South Korean claimants on North Korean assets, but not restitution. Focus on wage setting, not the initial conversion rate at time of monetary integration. We haven't even talked about the politics of this. When are the North Koreans going to get voting rights? Are we going to maintain the DMZ as a method of population control? If North Koreans start heading south, is the South Korean army really going to go out and shoot those people as they start coming across the border? We haven't even discussed these issues. These are going to be absolutely key. Um, so encourage North Korean reform. Uh, to try to, as, as, as I think it was Matt said, at least get some of the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, 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 the, 
the, the growth in North Korea as a, uh, as a precursor to policy. Then finally, uh, on the question of, um, about the, um, uh, whether investment should be by Korean and, and a possible peace dividend, there will be a huge peace dividend for North Korea. Uh, once you get the yoke of that million-man army off the economy, there will be a huge potential peace dividend for North Korea. There will be a noticeable peace dividend for South Korea, though I'm not necessarily endorsing reducing defense expenditure to 1%. Uh, there's possibly a modest uh, peace dividend for the United States. That depends on the ultimate disposition of U.S. forces, which I assume we'll discuss in the afternoon. And in terms of uh, the investment by South Koreans in rehabilitating North Korean infrastructure, that would be a very natural outcome. But there may be issues with uh, the, the WTO uh, government procurement agreement. So I wouldn't necessarily endorse a bi Korean policy. I think you'll get bi Korean as a natural outcome. Great, hey, thank you. Uh, Dr. Kim? Uh, yeah, uh, Dr. Chung talked about the most efficient scenario. What is that? And uh, Mr. Kuhnman introduced the German unification model. Yes, I agree with that. And also, uh, Professor uh, on the floor uh, asked about the conditions for the, uh, what kind of conditions for the economic uh, synergy effect. I would like to answer all these three the issues uh, in one. Uh, personally, I am pretty optimistic uh, about the uh, unification. Uh, especially, I don't need a unification as long as we uh, could exchange economic activities. I believe if we could uh, change the exchange the economic activities, the unification will be uh, come true uh, by itself. Uh, if North American can work in the South Korea uh, or South Korean investor can really invest their capital in the North Korea, then absolutely both people will uh, automatically want to unify in some day later. But uh, if uh, is there any possibility that we can lessen that period? I mean, uh, how can we just uh, realize soon? Uh, I do not really want to force the unification. Uh, I hope uh, if we can, no, uh, South Korea uh, facilitate North Korea to open their economy first then automatically unification will come true, I believe. Uh, absolutely, we need to prepare for uh, that rainy day. Uh, we need to have a uh, trade surplus and budget surplus, and et cetera, et cetera. But uh, as long as we could uh, exchange, even though uh, I said in my presentation at the end, I said uh, maybe it's not feasible in the long run, but uh, as long as we could exchange our economic activities, even to, to 50 years later or 100 years later, doesn't matter. Uh, unification will come true by itself. Uh, that's my answer. Hey, thank you, uh, Dr. Kim. So um, uh, a lot of issues on the table. I'm sure we'll come back to some of these in the course of the day. Um, let me uh, take the opportunity to thank everyone on this panel for their excellent remarks. Um, we will take a short break so that we can mic up uh, the next panel. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's give our group here a hand this morning. Thank you. Thank you.